Good evening. My name is uh, Alan Christie. I work for Tim Dudgeon over in the corner there. Uh, and I'm a solution architect at Informatics Matters Limited, which is a company that Tim set up that provides cloud native applications, automation and scientific workflows. Um, but my special interest is essentially uh, automation and um, uh, tools along those things. Um, I'm someone who's probably better writing programs to write programs than writing programs. Probably several of you have seen those sort of quotes. And I firmly believe that if it's worth doing once, it's probably worth creating a tool to do it. Um, I've been using Terraform uh, for about a year and a half uh, mainly with Tim and I've used it a few months before I joined him. I'm not, I wouldn't confess as being an expert in Terraform but more of a, an enthusiastic user. Uh, what is Terraform? Well essentially it's a compact binary provisioning tool that deploys infrastructure essentially from your workstation. Uh, it's it makes API calls to what are called providers. Um, you have built-in providers for the main cloud uh, infrastructure guys, but there are 90 other different uh, backends that you can use. It's charming because it has a relatively nice text-based configuration where you define your resources. Importantly, it's declarative, uh, so you tell it what you want and Terraform essentially builds a dependency graph and uses API calls to the providers to ensure that what you want is constructed. It's a tool that has open source and enterprise offerings. Its essence is provisioning um, as opposed to configuration. I didn't really understand the difference between these terms before this slideshow, so I thought I'd do some reading about it. So provisioning is, is really about generally creating immutable networks uh, provisioning equipment, whereas configuration, which you might find uh, is more uh, the domain of something like Ansible, another IAC tool, configuration is about changing the state of a system that's already there, generally. Importantly, and probably obviously, uh, Terraform appears to be cloud agnostic. So although it offers AWS and Google and Azure services, the configurations you write inside your configuration files are not. So you write a configuration for AWS, it's not going to work on Azure. Uh, Terraform, I think, is, is just a small link in a chain in the tools that I use. So I tend to use uh, Packer, Terraform, and Ansible. Now there's quite an overlap, especially with Ansible, um, with all of these tools. Packer, basically, I use to build binary images, your base operating system. I would then use Terraform to assemble my network of machines and then I would use Ansible to download, to, to load the software and configure it and adjust its, it, adjust its contents throughout the lifetime of the system. The configuration language for Terraform is, as I said, uh, a human readable text file, um, generally a, a .tf extension or you can write configurations in JSON. It's essentially uh, a tool by HashiCorp, so it's their configuration language definition. It allows you to create resources, equipment, stuff. Um, you then provide the, the class or the type of uh, equipment that you want to create and then give it an arbitrary name. So here's an example where I'm creating a resource that happens to be a scaleway volume and I've given it an arbitrary name and an application. The file name, uh, the file format supports uh, comments and strings and numbers and booleans uh, and importantly interpolations which we'll see here we'll come on to. But essentially it is a list of stuff you want and uh, Terraform will use that to compile a graph and then enact it. Uh, Terraform provides you with uh, obviously uh, a series of structures to define variables so that you can avoid repeating yourself, so satisfying the dry programming principles. So variables basically have descriptions, they have types, a fairly limited number of types. Everything in Terraform is essentially a string, um, but they give you lists of strings and maps of strings. Um, and the variables 
uh, can be defined richly. You either put them in your Terraform file, you can put them in, uh, provide them via the command line, a var file, environment variables, or if at the end of the day it finds that there's a variable it needs to use and it can't find it anywhere, it will just pop up a runtime query and ask you what value you want for it. Here, here are a number of variables, uh, a couple of variables uh, by way of an example. Here's one that has no value at all. Essentially, this would be something typically you'd use for a secret. So you'd either put that in a, a variable, uh, uh, an environment variable. So Terraform will, if it finds a, a, a variable in its configuration and there's a TF var uh, environment variable that reflects that, it will pick that up for you. Uh, if, if, if it can't find anything, as I say, it will prompt you to say, what, what password do you want? And here's a variable which has a description, um, and it's a map of keywords and values. I think that Terraform will infer the type of variable automatically, but for this example, I've put it in explicitly <coughs> to demonstrate. So one, one uh, important aspect of Terraform is the ability to uh, do essentially shell variable expansion, interpolation. So you've created all these variables, you've created your configuration. How, if I'm creating a node or, or a compute instance, how do I connect it to a network? So I have to refer to the uh, either variables or other objects. So interpolation basically allows you to put variables and expansions between curly braces as you see here. And you can look up all sorts of uh, material inside your configuration file. So you can refer to variables. The, every, every variable you create is prefixed with VAR. Um, so that's just a straight variable. Here I'm referring to a map. And here I'm referring to a position in a list. And I can also refer to objects that I create, resources that I create. So if I create a volume um, and I would go to my provider to figure out what I can create, um, that provider tells me all the types of stuff that you can create in terms of objects and lists all of the attributes that you can pull back out of that. So if I create uh, an IP address on AWS, obviously there's a property in there that allows me to extract that IP address. Um, I can also create modules, um, self-contained blocks of configurations, and uh, Terraform also provides a number of built-in functions that allow you to do string manipulations and more advanced stuff. So here I've got an example of, essentially this is a, a list lookup using an element function, provided with a list and an index. You can do simple mathematical operations inside your interpolations. Um, just basic add, subtract, multiply, divide. Here's an example uh, where I'm doing two interpolations. I'm looking up a variable that I've created. I've got a, a constant here and I'm also calling a function to format a number. And the, and the result of all of that will be a variable assuming the resource tag is, is, is demo and my count is zero to one. I can create strings and, and manipulate data like that. Terraform also has a console that allows you to experiment with these interpolations uh, offline, so you don't have to uh, create your infrastructure to check to see if they work. Uh, or I don't use these objects very much, but uh, just for the sake of completeness, uh, I've covered provisioners here. So as well as creating uh, basic, as well as creating objects, apologies, you can also call upon a provisioner. So typically file and remote execution. So this allows you to not only create instances but pop files onto them and then r run, run scripts in order to configure them. This is where the overlap between Terraform and Ansible becomes quite clear. I don't tend to use Terraform for this sort of stuff at the moment. But it, it does allow you to do um, post-installation configurations and things like that. Modules, I'll just touch on briefly, are essentially just a, a recognized way of organizing your configuration files. They're simply folders with Terraform files in. Um, and even if you don't have a module, 
the directory that you're in, that you're crafting your network from, is essentially the root module. Um, and you follow a san standard directory structure and it allows you to maybe publish anything that you create to uh, a public repository of, uh, of useful stuff written by the community. And say Terraform doesn't really impose any hard and fast rules on file naming, but for a module especially, your directory is expected to contain a main.tf, uh, variables, tf, an outputs.tf, and, and a readme. Um, essentially, the variables acts as your in the input to your module, and the outputs are the properties or outputs of the module. And we'll visit one later uh, at the end of the talk which is a, a, a convenient module that wraps up a lot of functions in, in AWS. So you might create some, if you're repeatedly creating a, a complex network, you might uh, collapse that into a, a directory and, and call that a module. Uh, as well as creating instances, Terraform has to provide you with the ability to do uh, loops and conditionals because if I'm going to create a node, how do I create 10 instances of a node? I don't, I don't have 10 configuration files or 10 blocks of, of objects. And also I might want to create things based on the state or some variable. So I need the ability to have some optional uh, construct for my objects. There's a slight delay on that. So in loops, Terraform provides you with a built-in meta parameter called account. So pretty much every provider class, every provider object has a built-in count. So here I'm creating uh, an AWS compute instance and I just put the count to three and, and Terraform will create three of these for me. Uh, I'm using the name here uh, and doing some interpolation. So at least the name of the, the resource is based on the count as well. So those would be instance one, two, three, four, etc. Uh, conditionals are really quite simple. They allow you to, uh, they're basically the ternary operator, which is a, an expression evaluating to true or false. So in this particular example, I have an AWS instance. I've set the count to this expression. So the count is either one or zero, which are basically switches this object on or off. So if the count is zero, Terraform won't create the object. That's actually probably the most useful part of, of the language is the ability to do that conditional cr construction. Uh, you also have uh, the concept of data. So pro each provider, uh, not only gives you resources like networks and compute instances, but it gives you data, which is essentially read-only information from your provider. And it gives you a real-time uh, external access. It gives you real-time information of your network. Uh, AWS, for example, has a, about 120 different types of data element. Here, I'm using the availability zones, which is provided by Amazon. If you go onto Amazon's console, you'll see that there are regions where you can create instances and each region has a zone. Um, here, I've got a data object giving me the availability zones, so I automatically know which zones are available in the region that I'm constructing stuff. Um, and here, I'm using the AWS AMI data object to in, to interact, well, not interactively, but dynamically search for the presence of a, an opera, a, a base image. So normally when you create a, an Amazon instance, you specify uh, an AMI, an Amazon machine image, basically an operating system version. Um, and, and this uh, data object allows me to provide filters so I can go and get automatically an image based on a certain set of criteria. So this will pull up a, an Amazon Linux image produced by them that's a 64-bit using GP2 as a, a service. So I don't have to go and find my images, I can just describe them. Another important aspect of Terraform is templating with the ability to di generate dynamic uh, files. That's what I tend to use it for because uh, quite often I I'm in a situation I've, des I've described, I'm using Terraform to build my cluster but then I move over to something like Ansible to do some fine tuning and more sophisticated 
deployment of applications. So somehow I need to get the the network information that Terraform has created into uh, something like Ansible. And I can do this with their templating feature. So in Ansible, you might have a, an inventory file with a list of hosts. At, at, at before Terraform is run, I have no idea what those hosts' names are or IP addresses. So Terraform allows me to do a bit like um, interpolation allows me to do some variable expansion. So there's my inventory file and all I have to... Wow, that really does have a delay on it. Apologies. Right. So at the top, what you're seeing is essentially an Ansible inventory file. And what we've got down here is a Terraform uh, templating. So I'm using the, cons the, the, the template file data object that allows me to identify a file, an external file, and lists the variables in it that are going to be replaced. So essentially what I'm doing is reading this file and replacing anything that's dollar master with this variable. So here I'm just inserting the private IP address of an AWS instance into that variable. That just does an in-memory templating uh, replacement for me. So I call upon a local file resource that allows me to write out that rendered infantry object as another file. So I basically name an input file, render it, and then write it out as another file. So at the end, once Terraform has run, my TPL file um, is rendered into an inventory file, which I can later use. So a typical workflow with Terraform, you created your configuration. It's a command line application. So you would uh, run it and, uh, and provide a subcommand. It literally is just Terraform space in it for initialization. Um, you have access to the ability to validate your configuration files before you run them. So you can do a Terraform validate and it will check the context, the syntax of your files and the content. But importantly, you can plan and apply. Plan, basically Terraform will look at your files and give you a list of actions. Basically, this is what I'm going to build um, and you can inspect that. And then when you run apply, it will run those actions and, and do the build for you. When you're finished with your infrastructure, if you don't want it anymore, you run destroy. So you just do a Terraform init, Terraform plan, apply, and then destroy when you're done. Importantly, behind all of this, Terraform has got to keep some state. It's not just creating your infrastructure for you, because as I said, it's a, it's a declarative language. So once I've deployed my infrastructure, I can go back to my configuration files and adjust them and run Terraform again. And Terraform will do whatever it needs to do to your deployment to bring it into the new state. So if I wanted uh, more instances of, of, a, of a compute instance, I go to my configuration files and just change the number. I run Terraform and it realizes, well, you had three, you want another three, I'll go and create them for you. Um, and it does that by keeping state in files for you. By default, they're kept in the execution directory. And, and they're, they're, they're basically just JSON files. Um, but the important thing to realize is that they exist. And if you delete them, you probably will have difficulty maintaining your infrastructure. You can resynchronize. Terraform has that capability, but they're quite important files. Uh, more importantly, if you're working with teams, you've got to figure out how you're going to share this state information because you need to share it and you need to lock it so that when I'm deploying a, an infrastructure for a customer and Tim comes along, it, it does, we, we don't deploy state at the same time. There are several options available to you. Say, if you're just working on your own, you just keep your state files on your hard drive. There, there's no harm there. But if, you, if, if there's more than one person, you've got to start thinking about remote storage. Git is an option, but it, it's not really viable because the state is dynamic. You're going to forget to pull or you're going to forget to push. Uh, and also the state files uh, may contain secrets. The passwords you're using may well be in those JSON files. So you might not want to share those. The real options are 
something like HashiCorp's enterprise version of Terraform, which is a subscription-based service. I think they're coming up with a free remote state storage solution for small teams. Or you can use something like Amazon's S3 and a DynamoDB table in order to um, store your state. And using Amazon is really quite simple. Uh, all you need to do is create a, an S3 backend object like this, define the region where your S3 bucket is, give the name of the bucket, the database table, and that's it. Terraform finds this file, it will basically put your state in your, inside your S3 bucket rather than on your drive. So I think we've covered enough there, I've got some demonstrations. So what I'll do is wonder why this thing is completely out of sync with uh, uh, the slideshow and switch to one of two demonstrations. So what I've got, what I'm going to do here is run a simple uh, Terraform task that's just going to create labels in, in GitLab. Um, nothing uh, mind-bending, but essentially I, I run my init here and, and the first thing it does is download the providers. It realizes I'm using GitLab so it will go to go and download its provider. I, I then run my plan um, because I have a variable that I've not defined, it's prompted me, okay, what project do you want? Again, I could put this in an environment variable or something, but I've chosen to type it in. And here's the plan. It said, I'm going to add one label and it's going to look like this. I'm just going over to GitLab here just to make sure the label doesn't exist. So now I, I apply that plan. It's, it's again asked me for the project, as I say, could be in an environment variable. I type the project name in and because it's potentially destructive it asks me are you sure so I type yes and it's done and now I refresh the page and the labels appeared in GitLab. So it's a pretty cool way of creating a bunch of labels if you need it. Here I'm running Terraform apply again telling it the project and the only difference is it's going to run it's going to be successful but it's because I didn't add anything nothing you know only changed one thing you nothing to do. And then once I'm done, I can destroy. The interaction is completely optional. As you see, I can use a minus force, so that doesn't ask me for confirmation. And it's destroyed, and if I go back to GitLab, uh, my label's gone. So if you want to create a dozen, 20, 30, 40 labels, if you have a bunch of projects, you could put them as Terraform files inside your Git repo, run Terraform, and it builds all your labels for you. That's just one simple demonstration of, of, of Terraform. The second one is... is a few minutes, a so five minutes long. Here what I'm doing is create, I, I don't have um, a, a diagram of what we're going to create, but essentially I'm going to be creating a network with a, if I pause that, um, I've, I've got a number of Terraform files, so I'm going to be creating a uh, the virtual private cloud, a VPC on AWS. Everything goes in a VPC and that VPC contains uh, a private subnet and a public subnet and I'm going to create a public compute instance and a private compute instance, put those on those two subnets, security groups so I can SSH in and a bunch of variables and some data which you can't quite see on the left hand side of the screen in order to accomplish this. So I've, I've run Terraform uh, in it again and it's downloaded uh, the AWS provider. Now I'm doing a Terraform plan and it's, it's going to construct the, the network for me and it's basically going to build 17 objects. I scroll up here so there are there's a mod, there's the VPC module um, which all of the routing information is in. We have um, 
security groups that it's going to create outbound um, and public and private compute instances. So at least you get a view of what's going to happen. Twenty seventeen objects are going to be created. Now all I have to do is uh, apply that. I'm saying auto approve because I don't want to be asked whether you want to do it. So Terraform's now going to go away and build that network for me. It takes about one minute and uh, 50 seconds in order to build the network. So nothing uh, special to see there. If I wind it forward So what's going on obviously in the background here is Terraform's now using the AWS API in order to create all of these instances, gives you a running commentary, still waiting for certain objects to be created. Um, I say this is a recording so I can't show you the actual network this evening, we could run it live later if people wanted to see that. Um, but it's going to create two instances, subnets, VPC and so on there, apply is complete, 17 resources added. So, and the next thing I think I do here is probably just decide to tear that down. And this time again, I'm using a force command line argument to tell Terraform, don't ask me whether I want to do it, just do it and now it's going through and destroying it. So there are about 17 objects, about a minute and 50 to create, and about a minute to destroy them all. And it has, a, it's, it's able to run some parallelism, so uh, I, I think in this case, we're not seeing anything particularly dramatic, but it can run um, uh, multiple threads and uh, in, install vast networks very, very quickly. So we can stop that there because it's not particularly interesting to see it all destroy. You'll take my word for it that it's actually gone. So uh, if, if I return to demo one, so th this is the GitLab uh, Terraform file that created my label. So all I have to do is say, I'm using the GitLab provider and that's a structure just to create a label. And in demo two, I used uh, a module provided by the community that allows me to create a VPC for those familiar with AWS. Um, which is quite complicated. Uh, I have to enable DNS, hostname resolution, I have to provide pr private and public subnets and I might need to produce a, uh, a NAT and VPN device um, so that uh, my private subnet devices can see to the outside world. I need to create a couple of instances, some security groups, availability zones and pick an, uh, a Linux image dynamically. So uh, all of that are in the, in, in the files that you saw being executed. And a number of uh, keys that allow me to pass in AWS credentials. The uh, AWS instance here is a good example of pretty much all the stuff we've seen, interpolation data, variables, resource attributes, etc. So here you can see I'm using the data object to, to get my image ID that's going to be running, the, the ver version of Linux. Um, I'm setting the node count via the variable here. I'm doing a security group lookup based on a security group that's created in a separate section of the file. And I'm creating a fairly complex name. That's it. I suppose at the end, the question is, is Terraform for you? Um, it's, it's difficult to say. I mean, there, there's a lot to think about. There are a lot of products on the market, uh, Ansible, Chef, Puppet, all of these IAC tools uh, ha have a niche area, but they also overlap quite dramatically. 
Um, there's a significant overlap and the choice isn't obvious. Um, and it's, it's a personal choice. Why I use Terraform is because I just needed to be able to efficiently create clusters uh, of nodes and lots of them. And then I use Ansible to do something else. So uh, thoughts. Uh, what I've shown you is very simple, but some of the complex networks that we set up are are quite demanding in terms of interpolation and, and other tools to make it truly dynamic and interact with other tools. So it can be an expensive initial investment. Um, and as I say, Terraform is just one of a number of tools. But th I've come across so many excuses that people use not to automate. Um, probably, Alan, it's just quicker to write a readme. You know, just write it down and I'll do it for you. Um, we all know where that goes. Uh, we're only gonna. We're not going to do this again. This is a one-time deal. Just, just get the network up. How many times have you done something and found you've done it ten times? And then the customer says, "Oh, I'd like one of those." Uh, um, or we don't have time. We're late on the customer's next feature. Well, there are probably reasons for that, and that's probably because you're not automating. Um, the 2016 State of DevOps report. I don't read these things. I just found this on the internet. So, John, probably you'd read this, wouldn't you, John? Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. So, apparently, it states that high performing organizations like the ones we all belong to uh, deploy apparently 200 times more frequently if they use a DevOps type strategy and IAC practices, especially. And they recover from disasters 24 times faster. And the important thing is we don't have time because we're already late. Well, if you adopt some sort of uh, IAC, you spend apparently 29% more time on your new features. So you do gain in the long run. As I say, that it can be an, an expensive initial investment. Uh, that's it. I've got the slides on GitHub and I'll share those. The one thing I haven't put are the video recordings, but I'll, I'll up those later, upload those later tonight. You've got my email address and details of the company I work for. As I say, we specialize in general software development, cloud applications, automation and scientific workflows. So at the moment, we're just deep into Packer and Terraform and Ansible as a way of helping us deploy our own software. And we're, we're helping other people do that. So I hope this has been of interest. And uh, maybe there are one or two questions.